Remove the subject's clothes. Yeah! 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 <laughs> Let us stare upon his baby skin. That's Will Ferrell yucking it up with a mock satanic ritual on True TV. Mock. Because there is no such thing as consciousness, extended consciousness, spirits, God, angels, demons. None of that stuff has any reality. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Here's a clip from my interview with today's guest, Isaac Weishaupt. I'm saying that when you understand how these people think, they believe that there's a sort of ceremonial ritual magic they can conduct where they can literally transform the world. And this goes back, we could finish our thought on who the Illuminati was. There was conspiracy theories back in the late 1700s that the Illuminati was behind the French Revolution. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris. Today, we welcome Isaac Weishaupt to Skeptico. Isaac is the author of several, actually many, high-ranking books on Amazon. If you are watching a YouTube on this, you can see me pulling them up and they kind of stream past really quick. But he's done a lot and some of them I've gotten up there in the kind of 5% realm on Amazon, which is pretty hard to do. And he's also the host and creator of Conspiracy Theories in Unpopular Culture, a podcast that I'm sure all skeptical listeners are subscribed to. I say that, I say that kiddingly because uh, one of the real reasons I wanted to have Isaac on the show today is because, you know, we did an episode on his show. He was nice enough to invite me on. And we had really, I thought, a great talk about why evil matters. And he had some good perspectives on that. And I just kept thinking, you know, one of the things I feel like it is difficult for me with Skeptico is I've been doing it for so long. And I know I have this base of not only uh, listeners, because it's not about listeners, it's about us all kind of growing in this information together, but I have this base of interviews and knowledge that I've gained whose origin is in science, like psi, you know, and like uh, near-death experience and like parapsychology researchers and Rupert Sheldrake and Dean Radin and all those people I super respect. And people I still interview, like I have an interview in the hopper with uh, Dr. Stephen Browdy, who anyone who's in the parapsychology community knows. But if you've been following the show, you know that I've also been headed down the conspiracy path. And as I've said several times, I didn't choose that. <laughs> it chose me because ultimately my finding in this show is that science as we know it, scientism, the idea that you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe is a fucking conspiracy. It's not accidental. It's best understood as a conspiracy. And that opened me up to guys like Isaac who have been coming at the conspiracy thing for a long time, going hard and really, really digging up some important information that, you know, if I was to run across Isaac's books and his podcast five years ago, I would have just dismissed it as all crazy stuff. Now I look at it, I read it, and it looks like, we're going to talk about this because I just told him yesterday, it looks like truth. It looks like much closer to truth than the stuff I was conditioned to believe. So, Long intro, but I think it's necessary, hopefully for anyone who's listening who, who kind of needed that. But also I think I'm hoping that that might help Isaac understand what I'm hoping to do in this show and why I want him to give us 
kind of a, 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 a teaspoon at a time introduction to his world and uh, uh, Illuminati and what that really means. If you can kind of get past that, oh my God, you know, this is crazy conspiracy stuff. What does that really mean? What does Illuminati really mean? All the symbolism that we see around in, in pop culture and, you know, is so overblown up right now. What does that really mean? What is, what is Jay-Z rapping with Abranovich? What's that, what's that really all about? What's all that stuff really mean? That's Isaac's home court, man. And he's going to bring us there. And hopefully he'll be that bridge from Psy, which he doesn't even know what the fuck Psy is, to all that stuff that he's all about. Does that sound okay, man? Oh, dude. Yes, absolutely. I uh, First off, thank you. I appreciate the the kind words and allowing me to be on your show. Um, my, As you alluded to, my my forte, my, my show, my subject matter, I try to keep it a bit more low brow. So hopefully we can kind of learn from each other today a little bit. Uh, I don't know what the fuck Psy means, but I'm about to find out today. Um, but I do think that there's, it's curious to me because my, my journey down this path, uh, roughly 10 years of me getting really deep into this stuff, looking at symbolism and saying, you know, why are these celebrities doing these symbols? And why do these movies keep telling us the same stories over and over? And a lot of folks have gone that far down the rabbit hole because, you know, I talked to, I talked to like normal people that aren't on the, uh, in the truth or community. Right. And, and most people are familiar with these ideas, but this year, in the last 12 months, I should say, there's been this, they call it the great awakening. There's been this renewed interest in this because it went from talking about this stuff as a theory to, holy crap, this might be real. And to me, it's very unnerving. And, and, and I got to apologize in advance. You caught me on a, I'm a, in a very shook mood right now. I'm very triggered. Totally. No, no. I, 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 <laughs> I mean, the, the monumental thing that happened at the Capitol building there. I mean, I don't know if I, I get And I guess it's because I've been like, I went deep down the rabbit hole on the great reset because I'm not a geopolitical guy. I don't, I don't really get into that. Hold up, hold up. Cause the great reset is something we are going to really have to de deconstruct for, for my audience, for me, for me, for me, for me, because You've done some phenomenal stuff on it, but we have to uh, teaspoon at a time. And I get that we're recording this, you know, the day after the Capitol thing, which is the ultimate theater. I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it, but it is the ultimate, it's the ultimate theater, you know? And it's like somebody really close to me and my family came down and said, oh my God, you know, the people died, you know, and stuff like that. Go, you know how many people die every day from suicide related to the stress of a very suspect kind of circumstances that have been placed on us with a certain uh, viral infection that has, I mean, we, this last 12 months has been extremely strange. And a lot of people have been triggered. A lot of people have died. A lot of uh, strange things have occurred. And I think that people who are just especially over the top triggered by what happened yesterday are, in my mind, not seeing the bigger theater picture. But there I go, man. I'm jumping into that debate. I don't want to, I don't want, not debate that discussion. And I don't want to have it. I tell you what I want to start with, because uh, when I was on your show, I, I, I told you something that is just really true. Like I read the introduction to your book on the Illuminati. And if you can recapture that for people and tell people about what the Illuminati is in just kind of simple terms, um, because I think it's very, very useful. It's a real thing. People need it as kind of a launching point to understanding the reality in history and then how it gets pulled and reframed in one direction and how it, it, it it's it's all these different things that we think it is it is exaggerated by one side but there is an ultimate reality to it too that's very strange and very dark 
Can we start there? Do, do you feel comfortable just kind of doing the Illuminati thing? For sure, man. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the curious thing. Uh, okay, so if we talk about the Illuminati and we and we look at it from the sort of like fifty thousand uh, you know foot view. To me, and and, it, and and here's where it gets a little dicey because different theorists describe it as different things. To me, when I talk about the Illuminati that I'm referring to sort of like the YouTube definition of it, where uh, you've got this, this long line of thought leaders that are employing dark arts, uh, using occult forces, using symbolism, using knowledge of how the mind works, knowledge of consciousness, otherworldly entities. I mean, you, you, you throw it all together in a blender and this is what I, I would argue the Illuminati is. Uh, then you've got like your textbook definition, which goes back to Adam Weishaupt, which I, I forgot the caveat. Every time I go on shows for the first time, I have to, I have to uh, make sure I tell people that's not my real name. Isaac Weishaupt is not my real name at all. Uh, it was a terribly foolish pseudonym I chose many years ago uh, and it stuck. And unfortunately, that's, that's now something I have to explain everywhere I go. Not Dude. terrible at all. Explain Weishaupt. So Weishaupt's the, uh, well, and I, I chose it because my my blog started out, it's called IlluminatiWatcher.com. And I got invited to do a radio show back in like 2011. And I was kind of like, you know, I was just a dude going to, I was taking a break before I started grad school and did a blog. And I uh, I thought, well, what the heck am I going to call it? What am I going to call my name? I'm not going to use my real name because this is like, at the time it was like, this is really bonkers territory, you know? And I just chose the I and the W out of there and went with Isaac Weishaupt because I thought it was clever. Uh, but, you know, people people roast me on that in, incessantly. I mean, I must get a question every day on social media about from some new, you know, person that says, wait a minute, dude, you're related to Adam Weishaupt, you know. So, yeah, I'm a shill, apparently. Because, <laughs> again, tell them who Adam Tell them Adam Weishaupt. Oh, okay, yeah. So Adam Weishaupt is a Jesuit priest who um, he or a Jesuit uh, college graduate. He um he in Bavaria back in like Germany, right? In 1776, he started the secret society. Um, and they had, and much like you see with the goals of the great reset, they have a lot of interesting ideas that seem noble. Uh, and it's always semantics, right? Like the, the, the official like goals of the Illuminati back then were to fight injustice, to, um, facilitate, uh, knowledge through science and not just rely on the church to give you the full version of reality because that's kind of how it was back then and he employed all the sort of things that you would expect from a secret society he gave people you know secret names secret handshakes and even uh, infiltrated some masonic lodges and what was curious a curious connection into my realm of studying pop culture and the occult he actually would have his higher up initiates separate and sever ties from their friends and family, which is sort of an occult uh, ritualistic tendency you see with, with, with certain events, like, for example, the mask, right? We talk about the masks for about a whole year now. And what they do in, in Freemasonic ritual is they put a hoodwink, a mask over your eyes. And the idea is you suppress the ego, you suppress the initiate sense of self and they can sort of create a new environment which therefore they can sort of be reborn into these new ideas so adam weishaupt would have his initiates uh, separate from friends and family completely which has been a recurring theme in like every disney movie right like the parents always have to die uh you know i went through this in my i, I wrote a whole book on star wars franchise and like the story is loaded with parental trauma of like you know you know like luke's got to kill his own father i mean <laughs> and and darth vader as a um a young man his, his mother was killed in front of him you know it's like it goes on and on and turns out this is connected into like secret society stuff but um well let's what, pause what, there for just let's pause there for just a second so we don't lose anybody so secret society um it, i, I want to really break that down because as our 
a past president, the good old George Bush said, I can't tell you anything about it. It's secret. And a big old smile on his face, like that wink and a non thing is always in play, but there's a reality to it too. So there's a reality to skull and bones, whatever, whatever reality you think it is. That's George Bush's secret society where they actually have video of them performing very dark rituals that you know, most of us, you could just say, oh, that's strange, creepy stuff that people do. So there's always this kind of wink and nod, kind of acknowledgement of it, but at the same time, make light of it. That's okay. You can take either camp you want. What I really wanted to nail down for people who are, are kind of doubtful is, okay, there's a real history, 1776. There's a real meaning behind it. There's real people who did it. And I would go back even earlier to 1666, Sabatia Zev, right? So Sabatia Zev, 1666. This is real history. Two, uh, 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 one, two million followers. His main thing was we got a break free of Judaism, uh, which is a cult at the time. It's like this high rule-based kind of wacky religion. You can only do this. And he's like, rebel against that. And you know how we should rebel against it? Do the opposite. Because look, in our book, you know, this is our book, the Bible, which is all our book. He's going to come when everybody's good or everybody's bad. And we've already tried the good thing. That ain't working. So let's try the bad thing redemption through sin. Let's do the most sinful things to our children, to other children, to, uh, you know, let's have orgies. Let's do stuff on the Sabbath. Let's make it secret. Let's lie. Let's deceive. Let's infiltrate. Do all the things that are the most evil that we can do, because that's going to bring about the second coming. I think there's a direct lineage between uh, the Sabantians and then the Frankists who follow, and you can follow that history and it goes right into Islam, but it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. It's the do what thou wilt stuff. And it's the kind of, uh, I can do anything to promote my end goals and I will deceive you with saying it's one thing or saying it's another and I will infiltrate and will be secret and will be all this stuff. So here's the connection I'm trying to make. Anyone who wants to investigate this, these parts are undeniable. The Sabbatean, Frankish to Illuminati stuff, there is a clear line. You just can't deny it. So you can deny all the rest of this stuff, but there's a certain part of this that you're talking about that's just history. And the fact that people are able to dismiss it so easily is part of the fucking thing. What, what do you think about that? Am I stretching that too far? No, man, you're, you're 100% dead on because I've got, I've got a stack of like a few books that go through like the history of the occult and sort of like major thought leaders of the past and to me to sort of simplify it because like I'm no scholar like I'm just trying to like sort of learn about these ideas learn about uh, the history of the whole thing and and history is you know sometimes it's a little muddled sometimes it's sort of rewritten by the powers that be of course but to me there's a clear line of the modern day occultists the modern day thought leaders that would I would argue be um the ones in this Illuminati that we call them, there's a clear line from that going all the way back to the secret societies of, uh, you know, ancient Egypt and Greece and Rome and their practices. They were doing sort of the same. And the reason I think there's a clear lineage is because they're doing sort of the same thing. You go back to uh, Pythagoras, you know, he started one of the first secret societies and he went around synthesizing all these secret teachings in Egypt and, uh, you know, in Greece and all there and uh, Mesopotamia, which, you know, fits into a much larger argument I have about the Capitol building as a symbolic event. But anyway, I know that's a big rabbit hole sort of topic, but you go back to the ancient secret societies and these occultists, they've been practicing different methods of making contact with a higher power, a higher dimension, uh, kind of like, you know, like, like you seem to, to believe in, you know, some element of spirituality. And, and I agree that to me, there seems to be this weird sort of 
atheistic push to think that, oh, you know, we just came from space dust and we're going to turn into worm food and that's it. It's over. There's nothing else to it. And I, I, I just don't believe that um, for many reasons. But the, the, the mystery schools, they all taught their initiates how to make contact with this other dimension, this higher power, the, the divine, as they would call it, God. Uh, through Apollonian or Dionysian rituals of, uh, you know, sensory deprivation, dance, drugs, you know, drinking alcohol, rhythmic dancing, uh, playing the drums, like you name it. There's a lot of it's, it's either you're depriving the senses or you're overloading the senses. And and kind of what you alluded to, um, there's this. And that's one one theory about this whole thing. Why are they doing all of this? Uh, is to bring about the apocalypse, the great revealing and the end times, which, you know, you could argue that if you look at, um, for instance, Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote the Illuminatus trilogy, which I didn't read the whole thing. It's, it's very confusing for me. Like, it's, I'm not a good fiction reader, but I, I read parts of it. And uh, he mentions that they tried, you know, we've tried capitalism, we've tried communism, we've tried fascism. The only thing left for, you know, the Illuminati, the world octopus con global controllers, the only thing left for us to try is anarchism. But try for what exactly? And that's, that's the big question. And like, clearly, I don't know the answer. And it would take a whole lot of people on the inside to reveal that truth. But to me, I think there's always been a spiritual component to this. And I think that continues to be found in, like you alluded to, this, this, theatrical sort of last 12 months we've had and i'm not saying like oh the virus is fake and this is all just you know hollywood special effects like i'm not saying that i'm saying that when you understand how these people think they believe that there's a sort of ceremonial ritual magic they can conduct where they can literally transform the world and this goes back we could finish our thought on who the illuminati was there was conspiracy theories back in the late 1700s that the Illuminati was behind the French Revolution. And the way the, the, way the history books teach it is that it, the French Revolution blew everyone's mind because before that it was just there was a, a, a aristocratic privileged elite bloodlines and, and royalty and nobility and all that stuff. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, uh, they get overthrown violently and now there's this egalitarian society and, and there's secular uh, principles instilled and there's now people have the freedom to do what they want. They have the freedom to accumulate wealth for themselves. And this was also very radical and it, co it, it corresponded with the goals of the Illuminati, uh, of, of the thinkers of the Enlightenment, the Freemasons, uh, and a lot of these sort of like groups you hear about like the Jacobins but they all sort of have been saying this kind of stuff. And when you look at the Great Reset, that's essentially what Klaus Schwab is saying from the World Economic Forum over there in Davos, Switzerland. If people are still with us, the one question that might pop up is, why would we associate the Illuminati with all these good things that you're talking about? egalitarian society and uh, rights given to the people and overthrowing what is clearly a corrupt system of lineage, you know, power and transfer of power just by your bloodline or concentrated in some completely corrupt church where there's 12 year old cardinal, uh, 12 year old uh, bishops that are, you know, given all this land and all this power. So, how do we how do we sort that out that like because in a lot of ways i think that's easier for people to understand and accept that there was a need for an illuminati force there was a good part of an illuminati ethos um even if it comes along with some other stuff that we can talk about can you help people square that in their mind and and possibly bridge that reality i First off, I'm going to fail to square their mind with it because that's something I've been trying to do for years <laughs> uh, because I wonder the same exact things. I look at all this stuff and I say, and, and the, ultimately I, I'll give you the sort of like 
I'll, I'll give you the uh, the final takeaway first and then explain myself. Ultimately, I think it's a ruse. I think that all these things are being um, are being sort of dangled in front of us and it's not going to be the case. I think it's, I, I fear that if we go into this idea of what they call the great reset, the new normal, this this global government that conspiracy theorists have been clamoring about for years and years and years saying, Oh my God, they're consolidating power. And you know, it's going to be, it's going to be bad news for everybody. If American democracy fails and capitalism fails and we go into this communist sort of globalist government uh, and, and, you know, going back to Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan said like, well, one way we could get there because he was, a, he was a globalist. Uh, one way we could get there is with an alien presence. We could unite as a, a globe because uh, he was planting that seed. But I do think that they would like that. And they're going to say, look, we need a global government because we need to sort of divvy out, uh, you know, the, the, this is what they say. They're like, we got to make sure you don't eat too much meat. We got to make sure you're not contributing too much to pollution because, you know, the planet's in bad shape. Um, and hold and up there. Now tell us who who they is, because you have some real specific stuff. I, I can't pin you down. I keep trying to bring you back to the 17th, 17th, or, or the French Revolution. You don't want to go there. You're chomping at the bit to go to this great reset. So let's go oh, there. Right, 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 right. Okay. No, no, let's go there, because this has been an important part of your work recently. But you can point people to the documents. You can point people to the modern day groups, what they've said. And again, if we laid enough of a kind of hint on the table, it sounds very enticing. Of course, you have to control your carbon footprint. My God, the planet is at stake. The whole environment, of course, you're going to give up your rights a little bit to do that. Of course, we have a population control. Of course, the, you're not going to have any money because we've had to you know, shut down the whole economy. Well, we'll give you money. You're just chip up and we'll give you money. Who is this Santa Claus guy? And who is he really? I mean, who really is he? And why is he so prominent in, in this story right now? Why is Bill Gates allowed to talk on all these health matters? What's his credentials? Who, 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 is, who are some of the players here that without us even realizing it are kind of ushering in this change? Ultimately, it's the, if you look at the, you know, Klaus Schwab, he runs the World Economic Forum, and they are like major thought leaders in the globalist movement. And they, they, the World Economic Forum is limited to the top 1000 richest corporations. And that's why I say it's a ruse, because I'm always extremely critical of, uh, you know, the corporations, you know, and th they want to say, like, this is literally what their argument is when you read his books and you read through all the documents and stuff, their argument is, look, people are greedy and we need to make sure that we divvy out just enough for, for you to live so that you don't ruin it for everyone else. And oh, by the way, the people that are going to do this are the greediest corporations that have made it to the top of the, uh, uh, of the economic system through, you know, all the all the nasty stuff the corporations do you know cutthroat stuff they do with uh, you know sweatshops and slave labor and all that kind of stuff that's that's pretty seedy so they want to say like look you guys are greedy we're going to let the greediest people on earth redivvy out the goods so that you won't be so greedy like that's that's what they say and that's why i'm like man f that because i'm with you on the sense that like the like the Illuminati, are they are they bad guys or good guys? Well, like if this is the Illuminati, like I would say they're bad guys. They have ideas that seem seem fair enough. They seem very common, not common sense. That's, that's the wrong term. They seem, uh, you know, a, a, appreciable. Like, well, maybe I don't think it's such a bad idea to worry about the the Earth. You know, worry about how much uh, how much meat we consume. Like. Cause I, I have concerns about those things too. I'm by no means a, a vegan, but like I try to be cognizant and not just mindlessly eat meat. I, I appreciate, uh, you know, the animal that gave its life for me, like that kind of stuff. But to see the people that are going to orchestrate it, that's where I think, okay, this isn't good. This is bad. This is everything that these conspiracy theorists have been 
warning us about for dozens of years, you know what I mean? So I think that, um, I think, yeah, there, there's a lot of concerns to be had with this great reset plan, which by the way, on the surface, they, they'll, they'll flat out tell you the big problem is America. They say America needs to be uh, removed as the global superpower and America needs to be, um, uh, what do they say? Something about how Western values need to be brought to their knees, something to that effect. And I mean, what do you, what, is, what does the world think we've been doing the last 12 months? They've been testing every single thing we've got in capitalism, throwing everything at it to try to shut it down. And that's always been my argument uh, because I don't believe in, in uh, QAnon and all that stuff. But I think that when we see stuff like what happened at the Capitol building, I think that's, that's helping out people like Klaus Schwab in this World Economic Forum Great Reset. Because what it does is that sends a signal out to the whole world globally, like, oh, American democracy, this is the thing we're supposed to model ourselves after, the one that regular, you know, a bunch of people just walked in and could have done whatever they wanted. I mean, thank goodness they didn't go violent with it. I mean, a couple of people died, but like, you know, that could have been a lot worse. And I think that sent a lot of weird signals and there's going to be a lot of weird rippling effects. And it all supports this great reset because Klaus Schwab has been saying it. America's the problem. We need to bring it down because this is the last sort of bastion of capitalism and democracy. Why don't you just give it up and join in this global super, uh, you know, dystopia that they want. Okay. You went full bore there on me. Full bore. Screw the teaspoon. Throw it out the window. Get the fire hose. Get the well, fire hose out. I, I told you I'm feeling weird today, Alex. So, I mean, I've, I've had anxiety for like two days straight, and like I don't even know how to make sense of things because I don't know, man. I, I, I'm very concerned about the the immediate future. Well, and, and you know, let me try and uh, again stitch that back to Skeptico as I generally do it. So I, I alluded to the fact that I just did an interview not too long ago with this guy, Stephen Browdy, Dr. Stephen Browdy. And you don't know him, but he's kind of well known in the parapsychology community, well known in the frontier science community, editor of a really great journal, Journal of Scientific Exploration. So, you know, university professor, all the the papers that are peer reviewed in that journal are from university affiliated people who are willing to explore kind of out there science like does telepathy really happen does remote viewing is that real what about these ufo things and stuff like that but here's the disappointing part about uh browdy and i can sometimes i don't know how but i wind up in some pretty uncomfortable interviews and it got a little <laughs> bit uncomfortable with steven though wouldn't you know and and part of the reason for that is that people are so closed down to this idea of conspiracy that they don't even see it when it knocks at their own door. So here's where it knocks at our own door in Skeptico. If you're interested in parapsychology, uh, you know, telepathy, ESP, you know, for the old term, one of the things you're going to be drawn to really quickly is the remote viewing project that was done by the United States government at Project Stargate, and they've released that now. And you're, you're nodding your head. You're familiar enough with that a little bit? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I talked about that in my new, uh, my, my new Alien book. Uh, yes, because there's a mental component to all this, right, is, is what I would argue. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Exactly. With that, I won't even go I always go down thing. Did you ever run across a uh, ufo researcher grant cameron yes uh boy and then it escapes me where that came from but yeah for sure I, I know that name well people will have to hear this for the five thousandth time on skeptico but what grant is kind of one of the things he's well known for is the uncovering the he didn't actually the one to do it but kind of popularizing this release of this accidentally declassified document that turns out to be really key. It's the Wilbert Smith memo in Canada, where he goes down to the United States and he goes, he brings all his UFO stuff secretly down to the 
United States and says, here, I'll tell you what I know. You tell me what you know. He comes back and he writes a memo to his boss and he says, wow, this stuff is top, top priority. Higher, more high secret than the hydrogen bomb. Here are all the names that people I, I met with. Uh, Vandevar Bush, uh, I forget all the other names, but the people who are well-placed and in the right position to kind of know about this stuff. But then what you just alluded to, in the last sentence of this memo, he says, and they believe that there is a mental component to this that is key to the whole thing. So this grant uh, suggests, and I agree with him, is part of the agenda for the MK Ultra, the reboot of the Nazi program, which it just is again, feeling you'll freak out. Reboot of a Nazi program. Well, that's just what it is. They didn't mean my MK, you know, is uh, and and uh, and the head of that, of course, is this Jewish psychologist. Interestingly enough, the the U.S.'s um, Mengele, uh, Sidney Gottlieb. Right. So he is the head of that. And he actually runs the Stargate program. A lot of people don't know that. But, the, you know, the Stargate guys who are doing the remote viewing, Hal put off Russell Targ. They have to talk about when Sydney comes to town and they have to placate him and all the rest. But the point of that whole thing, back to the Stephen Browdy, back to the skeptical world, is I'm going, uh, yeah, but Stephen, I mean, they knew with Stargate, that it's not consciousness is an illusion, biological robots, a meaningless universe. They fucking assume that from the beginning. You talk about this extended realm, spirituality. Well, they assumed that. They had books, uh, you know, they had Raymond Moody's book on near-death experience. They were talking to people who claimed to be witches, claimed to be magicians. They didn't give a shit. They were like, hey man, there were soldiers, you know, they were soldiers. We got to find out what the fuck is in the extended realm. We have to find out if it's a threat, which is always a cover story for saying we have to figure out how to weaponize it so we can kick somebody's ass with it. Right. Because that's what the military does. And that's what they always do. Well, that was the whole thing behind Stargate. So back to for people, the skeptical transition. Uh, fucking, if you're Brody, if you don't know that shit, you're not doing your job, bro. You are not doing your job. So don't sit there and tell me about, you know, Super Psy and all the rest of this shit. If you can't deal with that conspiracy, that known conspiracy revealed by 60,000 documents that are just released now and are in the public, if you can't embrace, if you can't process that, you're not in the game. And that's where, that's my point. Even fringe science, even frontier science, isn't in the game because they can't embrace conspiracy. They can't sit down and have this Illuminati talk that we're just having right now and process it and say, is the Sabbatean Frankish thing still in play? And does it trace back to the mystery schools and all the, uh, you're, you're, you're just not in the game if you can't process that one way or another. Yeah, most definitely. There's there's a weird, in fact, I interviewed Dr. Diana Pasolka. She wrote the book American Cosmic. Um, she she basically was relaying her experience working with the Invisible College, which is the, the, the longstanding rumor that there's been a group, not really a secret society per se, but a, a group of people covertly working on the UFO phenomenon since, I don't know, the 40s or whatever. And she hung out with these people. And the one guy who was like, she calls him Tyler, right? And Tyler is not, he, he's convinced, he, he doesn't even call it a belief in aliens. He says, look, I, I know there's aliens. I know there's UFOs. I, I work with pieces of these UFOs. So it's not a belief for me, it's knowledge for me. And when I interviewed her, I don't recall how it came up, but this, the takeaway was, he didn't know Tyler, this guy who like is apparently uh, into the, the alien religion or whatever that's going to be coming out. He didn't know who John D was. John D, of course, one of the one of the you know occultist sorcerers that was channeling information from the aliens. And he wrote the Enochian tablet, which was this language with which 
he was instructed he could communicate with the aliens and then Alistair Crowley and, and I don't want to go too crazy on you here but Alistair Crowley used that same Enochian tablet to channel his gray alien named Lamb in like 1917 and then that same text was used by Jack Parsons in 1947 as the uh to to summon the 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 whore of Babylon in the Babylon working rituals which as history tells us, was what possibly opened up the portals to allow the Roswell UFO crash to happen. And, and in my book, I go through this whole history of this whole thing. But anyways, the point being is like this guy who who's a scientist who is obviously into aliens didn't know who John D was. And that's concerning. And I'm not saying like, oh, because he's an idiot. I'm saying it's it's concerning because my my issue here is that People are trying to understand the mental component of this because they, on some levels, want to make a bridge to the cosmos, which, again, this is the same theme we see in all these ancient mystery schools and all these secret societies. It's this idea of ceremonial ritual magic mentally creating new realities, man becoming God. And that's what I would argue they're going to try to do or they're going to try to understand how to make this work through quantum physics or whatever. And, and that's some stuff we go into uh, another time. But the, the, the idea is that they have been researching this for tens and uh, dozens of years since the forties, how this works. And I would argue that they have a better idea of how this works than we know, because every conspiracy theorist tells you, well, you know, your DARPA's and your CIA labs, they're like 20, 30 years advanced technologically from what we know even exists. So I would argue they already understand how this works. And then the question is, you know, you talk to, uh, or you, uh, you watch like Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, he's, he's been talking about the UFO disclosure agenda. And his concerns are that they're gonna try to weaponize, they're gonna try to use this as the ultimate threat to build up a military for space wars and all this stuff which again, I don't know, maybe, I mean, we did start a space force and Dr. Werner von Braun on his deathbed told his, his close friend, Carol Rosen, hey, they're gonna say that aliens and UFOs are a threat, don't believe them, that's, that's the big false flag. And like, there's all these different ideas floating around and, and you know, they gave us, the, the Pentagon gave us full disclosure in March of 2020, right? During the midst of the, the, the biggest pandemic that we've seen in modern day and you gotta wonder what the hell is going on here something's in the, something's in the works i know that much and that's why when i say i'm i'm feeling very much out of my element in the last couple of days it's because a lot of these weird sort of occult themed ritualistic ideas manifested when they stormed the capitol yesterday and uh you know i talked about it like four years ago i talked about this sort of idea about the chaos and how we find order from the chaos this is the 33rd degree of freemasonry uh motto order ab chaos and trump was the chaos candidate all along and from day one to the last day apparently uh we've got nothing but chaos and it makes me and i'm very concerned that coupled with this alien thing what and then and then add in throwing this great reset thing and it's like man, where are we going to be in a year? Like, this is crazy. This is absolute pandemonium. This is a crazy time to be alive. And like, usually I'm the kind of guy that's trying to make fun and, and try not to be too heavy on stuff. But like, my head's in a bad space these last couple of days. I'm just like, I don't know what to tell you guys. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be the guy that's like hunker down with your shotgun, but you know, maybe. Okay, let me talk you in off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> Because look, bro, you're, you're kind of laying a lot of stuff out there and I want to deconstruct it the best we can. So it just doesn't yeah, sound, it probably sound crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's going to sound it's going to sound crazy to a lot of people. It's a lot. It's a lot. And that's OK, because because our reality, quote unquote, reality is crazy. The, 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 the yeah. idea, you know, the simple one I'm hoping to do a show with this because I never I don't like to get into this stuff, but, you know, science it's like the the final insult of to science to the idea of science has been the pandemic the last year 
and like the simplest way I like to do it, we chatted a little bit on your show, is masks, right? So make the connection between masks and public health policy, right? Because ultimately that's what we want from science. One of the things we want from science, one of the things we want from science is to inform us, who am I, why am I here? But the second thing we want is to effectively inform our policymakers as for making good decisions. So here's what we know about masks, right? As they relate to COVID. One, we know that some masks just don't work. If you're like me and you just cut off your t-shirt and throw it on your face, it, no one says that that would ever be efficacious in any way. That's why they have certain masks that have been tested in laboratory settings and are shown to be able to block the virus, right? Uh, and influenza virus is usually what they test it with, but COVID, vi whatever, you know, the same, the viruses aren't that big of a different a size. If it kind of stops one, they say, okay, that's a good mask. So this mask does nothing. The other mask does something, okay? Is that reflected in our public health policy? No, not at all. Just wear some kind of mask, you know, you know, some kind of face covering. There's no thought at all in terms of what that would be. That is, a, anyone could just look at that. Well, that's a failure of that policy. But the second thing that we know, and we talked about when we're on your show is, there is a certain scientific, if you will, medical protocol for mask wearing, right? You don't wanna put on the mask and then touch your face, adjust the mask and all this, because whatever the mask is touching is now on your hand and whenever you touch it, it does. Oh, you don't wanna do that. There, it, well, we know that isn't taking place. So then we go and we look at the science behind it. And, and this has been going on for a long time because we've had the fear of influenza spreading as well as all sorts of different, you know, back when we had the COVID uh, number one SARS and stuff like that, they were very keen to do all these studies and they did them in hospitals. And what they found is that you can get a mask to work in a laboratory, but then when you go in the hospital and you do clinical trials and you give all the nurses and all the doctors masks, it don't make no difference. It's not efficacious in controlling the virus. Why wouldn't it be? Well, for all the reasons we just said, there's all this protocol in terms of how you use the mask, whether you reuse the mask, how you touch it with your face, all that, it all breaks down. And the little bit of benefit that you could have gotten goes away. There is zero effectiveness in clinical trials. So then you look real world examples and you start pulling in data, right? And you start looking at a county that controls masks and one that doesn't and periods that do that. And there's just virtually no difference in the infection rate of uh, people, whether they wear a mask or we don't wear a mask. So is that any of that reflected in our policy, in our health policy? No. That to me, is highly suggestive of the pandemic, as some people like me and you call it. Why wouldn't there be a closer link between science and policy? Because you don't want a link. You just want to be able to wave your arm and pass along edicts that sound sciency enough for people to follow them. You don't really want science. Sure. Uh, I think that, and to play devil's, and, and I'm with you, right? Like, Paul, like much like the the guy running the World Health Organization isn't a doctor. Bill Gates isn't a doctor, medical doctor, I should say. Excuse me. Uh, they're not medical doctors. Politicians generally aren't medical doctors. They're not scientists generally. Uh, there's, they don't, they're not really in the business of science. They're in the business of you know, politicians are in the business of serving the American public, the taxpayers is ideally what they're supposed to be doing, right? Now to play devil's advocate, I would argue that the reason we see them saying to wear the masks are because I think, and this is like in some weird way in support of the masks, okay? In some weird way, I think that they want to give people confidence to go out and shop because 
fueling the economy is good. That's good for America. We need to do that on some levels, but you can't, you can't sit here and pump fear into the public and tell them there's a contagious deadly virus. Uh, you're going to catch it. And here's some horrific stories of, you know, couples that died holding hands in the hospital bed and their families couldn't visit them, but get out there and go spend your money. Don't worry about catching it. Like, I think they need to sort of, they talk on both sides. They, they need you to be scared of it. And then they would, and, and right or wrong, like I'm not, a, I'm not a medical doctor. I've talked to a lot of medical folks um, that I trust and they, they've sort of like corrected me. And, and I'm not saying like, I don't want to go on a record and be like, Oh my God, COVID's the scariest thing ever. But like, clearly there's a virus of some kind going around called COVID and it affects some people. Right. But I think that the, the, they need to speak out both sides of their mouth. They need to scare us of the virus, but they also at the same time need us not too scared that we don't go out and spend our money. So the masks serve a purpose of, well, it gives you a, a, a weird um, confidence, like a weird safety net, a weird sort of, uh, you know, seatbelt on the airplane sort of effect. You know what I'm saying? What do men of power want? More power. <laughs> More power. It's about control. The more I control, it's it's always good. I control you one way, I control you another. This is uh this is Roman man, divide and rule. Fear is is just a is just a tool. It's just a it's just a tool. It's the same thing with the the vaccine, you know. I won't even get into all that stuff, but even that phony fuck uh Fauci acknowledges this is what they say the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting covid this is like a very subtle part but it's in there what it does is reduce the the symptoms that you will the, of the disease so you're less likely to die is the claim mm -hmm. but that is not to your point that is not how they're going to sell it or spin it it already isn't the public perception there's no way they could swing the public perception back the other way it's you know, poke and fly, baby, get your vaccine and then fly on the plane. Well, how have you reduced your chance of infection? If, if, if our man Fauci himself says that that's not what the vaccine does. So it, 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 pulling it back to the 50,000 foot view again, this is the ultimate failure or success of science, right? Because science now is just a complete tool of the people in charge and they don't have to really ever really use any real science. You know, they don't even pretend to have a, a public scientific board that is somehow responsible, that is somehow public, open to debate. Oh, they are so far from that. And, and, and it, what it disturbs me is people, quote unquote, in my community who are science minded, they don't seem to see any any problem with that. They're not up in arms. They're just because they don't understand the conspiratorial part. They're not willing to at least consider Santa Claus and his great reset and, and the absurdity that you're mentioning that how could somebody, how could the richest corporations in the world possibly suggest that we hand over all our rights and all our wealth to them so that they could redistribute it for our benefit. I'm not down with that. Absolutely, man. And, and I'm, and, and this is where, when I say my mind has been sort of scrambled, it's because over the years, looking at these conspiracies, you know, as part of sort of this truth or community, I always say I'm a bad truther because like, I don't, go all in on every conspiracy that comes across my my email but the um over the years like we we've been pointing out how you know how bad this and that is and how terrible this and that is and uh you know the truth is is that capitalism and american democracy has got problems there's problems with it and we point them out all the time over the years we pointed out to a million of them but my concern is that well, I don't necessarily want to go to the globalist government for the solution. Like, I think we've got some flaws, but like, 
let's just try to fix those things. I mean, I don't want it to get worse, right? But like, there's there's a lot of weird sort of dilemmas that we face because, uh, you know, with the QA non movement and uh, a lot of the stuff that they've been saying, that coincides with a lot of the material that I've been getting into that I say, yeah, I think that it's possible that some of these heinous things could be happening. But yet again, like I draw the line and I say, but I don't really believe that there's this great salvation coming from this uh, movement. Like I, I, if it would have happened, it would have happened by now. So like I, it, it's been a really turbulent year to try to like, because before this, we were just floating theories out like, oh, listen to this. Isn't this crazy? And 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 it wasn't there was no sig- no uh, no real impact, no real world impact, no real significance, no repercussions from it. And now we're seeing things manifest and it really give, makes you pause and sit back and think, well, gosh, maybe maybe we need to be a little careful about what we say. Maybe we need to be a little more careful about what we're telling people to do, you know, and, and that's why in I what, always in what way do we need to be more careful? I, I, well, don't, like, I don't really, I don't really understand. Because people aren't, you and I, we can have these conversations. We can talk about the aliens. We can talk about blood sacrifice to these gods and all this wacky stuff. And, and we can both say, that's really interesting. You know, maybe, right. Maybe there's something going on, but when you, when you're looking at, you know, 350 million people in America, that hear these messages. Some of them are going to run with that. And, be hell bent on thinking like, uh, Oh my God, like they're really doing this. And the reality is like, we don't the know. Reality some of these is some are people true. are, the reality is they are really, some people doing are doing it. it. Yeah. And they yeah. have done it for the longest time. And I mean, yeah. well, you know, one thing we got to, we got to throw in here cause we kind of spent a lot of time on, on the last show. I think, uh, spirituality is ultimately central to all of this because spirituality is ultimately central to, who we are it's the yeah, ultimate the human who experience are, for sure who are we why are we here as i started saying you know the ultimate conspiracy reveal for me is that this idea that you're a biological robot meaningless universe that scientism as we know it is true is the ultimate conspiracy because what better way to control you than for you to think you're nothing that you have no meaning that that voice inside your head, that essence of who you are, doesn't even exist. So you are a Christian, which I got major problems with, but I set it aside because you're like five steps ahead of the game of the atheists and 10 steps ahead of the game of the Satanists. So in Satanism, we have to broaden because as a non-Christian myself, Satanism means something different to me than it does to you. But I don't want you flying under the radar with the spirituality thing. And I want you to kind of share a little bit how you're processing all that stuff. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So like, and and this isn't one of my, it's not a topic I, I hit on too hard on my, in my books or in my shows, because uh, I am open-minded and skeptical enough to think that, well, I mean, I, I don't know for sure you know, and that's what faith is all about, right? Like, we just don't know. Uh, you know, and I was born and raised in the Christian faith. And it didn't, it didn't really resonate for me. And when I was 16, my, my mom was like, okay, cool. Like, you don't have to go to church anymore. If you don't want to, I was like, sweet, I'm out later. Because I didn't like it. I didn't get along with nobody in there. I felt like I was the weirdo there. And I didn't feel accepted. And I was like, man, these guys seem like a bunch of, you know, hypocrites and stuff. And then several years later, I uh, I joined the Orthodox Church, and I found a sort of something resonates within me. And the best way, the, and and the best way I can describe it is it's it's like therapy, right? I never want to go to therapy. I go see a counselor, right? As you as I alluded to, I have anxiety. You know, <laughs> I don't medicate, but I do go to counseling, right? And the I never want to go. I never want to go to counseling. And then the day before I'm like checking my email, I'm like, please I hope he cancels. I hope he's got something to come up so I don't have to go. And I never want to go. And I drive down there and I'm dreading it the whole time. Like, Ugh, I don't want to do this. And then when I leave, I feel great. And it's the same with church. I never want to get up early. I never want to get dressed. I don't even want to go in there. And I go in there and I feel like a million bucks when I leave. And I think something's happening on a subconscious level. I don't know what it is, 
I've never talked to God. I've never, I, I pray, but like, I'm not one of those people that's like, Oh, Jesus came and talked to me and I felt his presence. Like, I wish I had that level of interaction because then my faith would be you know, really strong. Um, so like, it, it's a weird, it's a weird territory I'm in where like, I believe it, but then I also think, well, maybe I only believe it because I was like sort of born and raised in these stories. And I feel a weird sense of like, uh, you know, if I don't believe and I die, I might go to hell. So I better believe. And you know what I mean? Like, like if I'm on a plane no, and we no, hit, no, that's we hit real, turbulence, I'm, I'm saying prayers. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm doing it. You know what I mean? Like, no, and, I, no. and I don't know, am I programmed to believe that? Or is there some authentic spiritual thing oh. there? I don't know, dude. I'm, so I, I'm, I'm with you in a sense that I get it. I get how like people can not believe in Christianity and say like, oh, this is all just a big psyop. I get it. But that's not me. I, I got it. Uh, you're awesome. You're awesome. I totally respect that. You know, I, I did an interview. Pause one second here. I'm going to pull it up. He's a freaking genius. And he's a genius. He's a spiritual genius. And uh, his name is Jürgen Ziva. Have you ever heard of Jürgen? No. Jürgen has had some amazing out-of-body experiences that he's chronicled in his books. Among the most detailed uh, and inspirational uh, accounts that he has, and you just happen, to, you, you just have to hear this guy. But I, I was going to play the clip, but I'll just kind of tell you. So he's not a religious guy. And he's not a Christian, but he's spiritual as fuck. He's going on this tour, and he's down at that island in Greece that is the monastery. Have you ever seen that thing? Greek yeah, I've got it tattooed on my torso, the Mount Athos. Goes to Mount Athos. You want to talk about synchronicity kind of shit? He's there. And, you know, it's like you can tour, you can walk, you walk all the way up the mountain and then you tour around, you know, it's very austere and all that. So he starts talking to one of these monks, which is unheard of. And the monk mm -hmm. identifies him as somebody who's legit. And he says, I want to show you something. And he takes him into this darkened room. It's completely dark, he says. And he sits him down. And he goes over. This is like ancient shit. There's this chandelier with candles on it. It's way up there. And he slowly lowers down the rope. And it reveals this Greek Orthodox icon that is on the wall. And Jürgen, Jürgen is, he's traveled to the other dimensions. Like he, he's not like going to get blown away. He's blown away. There's tears rolling down his face. There's this supreme ecstatic love that fills his body from viewing this icon. And the monk just nods and smiles. And that's it. He pulls the chandelier up and they go outside and they're brothers, spiritual brothers. So they don't have to talk a lot. But the next day, Jürgen comes back because he wants to see if the experience is, is real, right? Yeah. And it's like shut down. Like everyone's like, what do you mean? You know, and he says, yeah, no, the monk took me back there. He is. The monk didn't take you back there. We have guys who've been at the monastery for 10 years in meditation and study. They haven't been in there. He sure as hell didn't take you back there. And suddenly he sees a guy up on the next level, just kind of laughing. Ha, 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 ha. And he comes back and he rescues him. He says, okay, you're going to tell you what, let me take you to another one. And he takes him into a separate little room, darkened, lowers down the chandelier icon on the wall same thing same experience unbelievable joy ecstasy love god light you know if there's one thing that we can leave people with in this that does bring you in off the ledge is it's really about the light the darkness gets way way too much press bro way too much press <laughs> It's about Absolutely. the light. So that's Jurgen. You, you, you got to go. I don't do a good job. Don't, don't do him justice. You can hear him tell the story. And he's not out like 
looking for pub or anything like that. He's just the most amazing uh, guy who's experienced that. And he has virtual reality thing out again for free. You know, everything I, I said, how hey, I want to help you with the virtual reality thing. He goes, the only, the only restriction I'd make is whatever we do, it has to be put out for free. I want people to experience what I've experienced in these uh, transcendent realms. And I'll just add one thing, you know, that I, that I asked Gary and I go, so you had that experience, right? That really happened. He goes, yeah, I go, but you're still not Christian, right? You got to chuckle. He goes, oh, no. Really? Christianity is an intermediary, an unnecessary intermediary. Sure, Christ consciousness, connect with it anytime you want. You don't need the Bible. You don't need the icon. It's just a vehicle. You're going to church. You're connecting. The church, it's great. It's there. But it, it's just, it, it, it's not a necessary step. It's like, if it's necessary for you now, then that's great. But it's, that's my. <laughs> I can see that. I, say, I could get behind that. Oh man, we, we've kind of uh, uh, lost the lost the road here a little bit, but I want people to go and look at your excellent information on the occult Hollywood thing. You can get it from a lot of different sources, but I think the way that you do it is actually quite unique, very accessible and very powerful. Can you leave us with some thoughts on on what that means to you? Yeah, so the the idea is that, like for me, I'm learning as I go, and some people are new to it, so my my earlier works maybe resonate better than the newer ones, because the newer ones might be too deep down the rabbit hole, but what got me intrigued by all of this, and what a lot of people are drawn to when they first get into this, is all of these symbols, and these sort of, uh, you know, messages that they see in movies, and predictive programming, and when you read through the literature of the occultists and you understand the, the, uh, the high profile rituals, the initiation ceremonies, you, you understand the, the allegories that they give to their initiates. Um, you know, like for instance, the skull and bones, for example, we'll, we'll take the skull and bones. They take their initiates and they put them in a casket and, and they have the skull and bones obviously as their logo, which in the in the freemasons they they have a thing called a reflection chamber and the initiate sits in there in the dark and has a there's some skull and bones there and and the whole thing is the initiate needs to reflect upon death and this goes back to the the pyramids of giza they would they would bury them underneath the pyramids for three days then bring them back up they all the, the idea is the 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 self that you know needs to die so the initiate can be reborn and this is exactly the processes that we see in a lot of Hollywood movies. Uh, you know, Deadpool is one off the top of my head where, you know, they go symbolically, they go underground, they die, they're reborn and the rebirth happens. And it's an alchemical process. It's what, when people see that goat with the boobs, you know, the Baphomet on the, on the forearms, it says solve and coagula. They're Latin terms for dissolve and to bring together, to coagulate. And that's exactly what they're trying to do on a massive level. They've been showing us these topics and themes, but they're embedded in real world mystery teachings. And I'm not here to say what's right or wrong uh, because I question a lot of this stuff too. And, I, and I, like I said earlier, I go back and forth. Is this Illuminati? Are they the bad guys? Or are they the good guys? I, I don't know. I, I don't profess to know the answers to it. I just know that a lot of the things we we witness and observe their high level rituals. And the more that we know about it, the more discernment we can have. And I would argue that we can be better at identifying the path that we're on and we're going down and at least have some say in what it is that we want the future world to look like. Because believe you me, they're destroying the version of reality that we know to try to recreate a new one. Uh, and we need to be a part of that process on some level. So yeah, we, all my books talk about this subject just in different ways. Like, like Kubrick's code. I talk about Stanley Kubrick movies and all the themes you see in there and, 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 and so on and so forth. Again, if this is the, the teaspoon on ramping for some people who, who maybe 
would at first glance say these ideas are wacky and maybe you're going to be the introduction to the non-wackiness of them. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I find myself in that role oftentimes. I get a lot of people that that reach out to me and, and you know, and I'm very humbled by that, but like they, they kind of tell me I'm the red pill that, that sort of snapped them out of stuff. And, and I don't want to look at it like, oh, I snapped you out of like a Morpheus or whatever, but like to me, there's a lot of a lot of truth buried in a lot of these ideas that uh, that I'm talking about, and I like to give examples in entertainment because for me, it's like Francis Bacon w- was always professing that you can teach someone better through entertainment than to directly lecture them. So that's kind of why I, I have this sort of niche of uh, tearing down entertainment and movies and films and pop music videos and explaining the occult agenda behind the ideas within them. You do a great job. You make it Thanks, very, uh, I don't want to say entertaining because that kind of turns it in the wrong way. You just make it very comfortable. It's enjoyable to listen to. you got a great voice. Oh, thanks. I try, delivery. man. I, <laughs> I try, you know, and I, and I grew up with like, you know, the Alex Joneses and the Bill Coopers. And I try to take what I like from the people that, I, and David Icke, I try to take the things that I like and incorporate them. And, and I'm learning and constantly trying to perfect it. So yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks again to Isaac for joining me today. Thought it was a great conversation. I guess the one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is Illuminati. What do you think? Where do you go? Is it a please unsubscribe river you just can't cross? Let me know your thoughts, of course. I'd love to hear you over on the Skeptico Forum. That's the best place to reach me. But if you track me down anyplace else, I'd love to engage with you there as well. I have some really great shows coming up, a ton of them in the hopper. I'm almost embarrassed about how far behind I am, but I'll just start spitting them out there and see what happens. Until next time, take care. Bye for now. <laughs>